So welcome to our lecture number 18. We are going to start discussing about extensional regimes today. That, that means uh, continental rifting and extensional tectonics. Um, and these are the topics we are, I hope uh, I'll be able to finish uh, them today, like continental rifts, you see, we'll discuss a bit about this, normal fault systems, and then we'll discuss about symmetric and asymmetric crustal extension, these two um, end members. And uh, then we'll see something called, uh, a topic called metamorphic core complexes. Uh, quite interesting, uh, you'll see what they are. And then about the evolution of a reef system, some, something about the igneous rocks, uh, the magmatism and volcanism associated with the reef systems. And uh, we'll end with the causes of rifting and uh, what we call active and passive rifting. Next time, I'm gonna take you on a virtual tour of some of the great rifts on our planet. I think it will be very interesting. So if you can, please come next time as well. All right. So. Um, Today, we dedicate this class more to the theory, but you'll see it's uh, pleasant, it's not, not boring. And uh, uh, as you can see here, we discussed about the tectonic plates, we discussed about the boundaries of these plates. But as you can see, in addition to what we already discussed, like you see the, the mid-ocean uh, ridges in, in green and the subduction uh, zones in red and uh, in gray, the transform boundaries, now you can see on this map something in blue, yeah, and you can see here something called the Rhone uh, Rhine Graben in Europe, or uh, this major major reef system, continental reef system, the East African reef system. Then something about the Baikal Rift um, and the Basin and Range Province in the United States, uh, the states of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Nevada, yeah, the state of Nevada. Uh, very typical for for this, and um, we'll discuss uh, each of these cases next time. Um, but first, let's uh, let's look a, a bit at the theory behind these things. So when we talk about a rift or a rift system, you see we are talking about um, continental lithosphere that is undergoing extension, or it happened in the past. So if it's a, a rift that is no longer active today. And uh, we'll, we'll see an example. There is one uh, a, a, a big rift called the Mid-Continent Rift. Um, it, it sits where the Lake Superior is between Canada and the United States. Uh, it's a mid-proterozoic rift system. That means 1.1 billion years old. Um, it uh, is not active, but it almost split the uh, continent. So uh, let's look a bit at um, so I have some text which I took from uh, some sources. You will read this text. Um, this is from a book, uh, a different book, not not the textbook. So the the text here I put more so that you have time to to read about it and some of the figures which I think are very good in this book. Um, but the idea is when we talk about continental rifts or graben, grabens, um, the the word graben comes from the German language, which means like a trench, yeah? So they, they call it gravens, yeah? So you see this word as well. Um, we are talking about a structure that is uh, relatively narrow, relative to uh, its length, it's narrow, um, and it's fault bounded, yeah? It is fault bounded. We have a, a normally we have a central ax axial depression. So the, you, you can see here the depression. So due to the normal faulting on the sides, um, we have this uh, depression. And what happens when this forms, uh, because of various processes, and uh, we look at this, we, uh, we get the shoulders, the, this would be called the shoulders of the reef system, they are uh, elevated, yeah? So what happens, you can imagine that we have multiple processes that happen, not only the geological process that that or tectonic processes that leads to the formation of a rift, but the surface agents start acting if you have topography. So now we, we create this topography, obviously you are starting have it to have erosion and the position of 
sediments yeah, in the gravel as well. So this is very interesting. Um, there are there are also we have the situation like the one in Nevada where we have broad regions of extension, broad regions of extension, um, and we have a certain type of uh, structures like we have something that is called the horse and gravel um, structures, and um, horse comes also from German language as well. I'll show you uh, what this means. Now, let's look a, a, a bit at the idea of extension, yeah? So extension, uh, so the rifting, and we'll discuss about the ca causes of rifting at the end, but the rifting leads to the stretching of lithosphere. So you see in these first two diagrams, if you have an initial lithosphere and it gets stretched, you see what happens, yeah? So it gets stretched, but also it, it gets thinned, and you see the asthenosphere, uh, rising up, yeah, and this leads the movement of the uh, asthenosphere and the decompression leads to melting, and you would have magmas that penetrate the lithosphere and go into the crust, and you would have magmatism and volcanism associated with the rifts. Now, here is an, a very uh, interesting example that it shows you dimensionally if you have something um, that evolves into a rift that is. You see this, these two lengths, uh, LU uh, initially, which is uh, 80 kilometers wide, and then it evolves into a rift, which is 160. So basically you have this stretching and it shows you what happens in terms of the thinning. You can see the thinning of the lithosphere. Now, an example, let's uh, also give uh, some examples, an example, uh, comes from um, the North Sea. Now, the North Sea is very famous, uh, the offshore, uh, uh, the Netherlands, yeah? Offshore of the Netherlands is very famous for, um, and towards Norway, uh, for its oil resources. Yeah? So it has been um, analyzed uh, and studied uh, in great detail because of the oil industry. So we have, a lot of seismic sections that did the radiography of the structures there. So here is an example of this uh, Viking gra uh, graben, uh, this rift, and you can see basically how the uh, the stretching of the lithosphere, as you, you see it here, leads also to the stretching of the crust. So also the crust fins. And here the moho is, was imaged, and you can see this stretching, you can see the normal faults here and the structures that that uh, are associated with this rift yeah, in the North Sea. Now we have sediments, and you see these are the sediments that fill the rift, and these are the hosts for the oil in the North Sea. Yeah, uh, the sedimentary basin basically has these layers that host the oil. All right. Now um, here, this text gives you examples of. Uh, the amount of extension. So you'll see next time when we talk about the upper Rhine Graben in Germany, for instance, the Rhine being a major river in Europe, um, the extension, yeah, you see, uh, is of about five kilometers. Whereas if you go, for instance, in New Mexico, in uh, the United States, the Rio Grande Rift uh, uh, suffered the extension of about 50 kilometers, for instance, yeah? So that's, that's the idea. And Obviously, you have this extension that generates these faults, and earthquake activity is also associated with the rifting process, uh, where you have the brittle part of the crust. Now, at depth, you have ductile flow, so, so the thinning uh, is accommodated by ductile flow in uh, the lower crust. All right, now, um, you see the idea of these normal faults and typically the angle should be steep, 60 to 65 uh, degrees. And we have this terminology, like this block that goes down is a hanging wall. And the, um, on the other side of the fault, you have the foot wall. Yeah? So that's the idea. All right, so now I was telling you about forced and graben uh, structures. So imagine a region that underwent uh, extension 
and uh, an older here it says an old concept yeah that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist but initially people thought that we have when you see uh, this topography of basins and which would be the gravens and then uh, elevated uh, parts of basement which would be their horses yeah so um, this type of topography you see it in the basin and range province in the western United States like if you go to Nevada for instance and you see that's why it's called basins so basin and the range yeah so you would see this these ranges and in between them are these basins. So initially the thinking was that the structures look like this, but it was uh, subsequently uh, understood that in many instances, actually, the, um, the actual extension was accommodated by what you see in this lower um, diagram. Yeah, So you would have uh, a major detachment fault along which you suffer the, uh, the the extension occurs and then you see these tilted blocks so if you are at the surface yeah you are if you are in nevada let's say you see these ranges and in between you see the uh, the gravens the basins yeah and this would be called half gravens because they have normal fault only on one side whereas a full graven yeah would, would have normal faults on uh, two sides. That doesn't mean that this uh, this type of structure doesn't exist. I'm going to show you an example. It comes from the North Sea. But um, in the end, people realize that in many instances, we have this situation. All right. So I think it's very interesting. Uh, and you can picture how, how the extension is accommodated in the upper part of the crust, in, in the lower crust, and in the lithosphere. So, Possum. So I'm showing you now uh, when we talk about the normal fault systems. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the textbook of Fossen, you'd see these diagrams and you'd see something that would correspond. Uh, sorry, let me go back. That would correspond to this. This is what Fossen shows. He calls it the uh, domino style stretching and the development of horse graben systems. Or if you have this detachment, yeah, uh, this uh, detachment, um, you see it, it starts with a least strict fold, normal fold, and you see these tilted blocks. Now, of course, when this happens here uh, uh, at the base, we are not going to have gaps. So the, uh, you have even more faulting at the base and the geometry becomes quite complex. And you see the same from the other textbook, the same thing explained here so you can have um, this situation and then you have the tilted fold blocks um, and then you you must have uh, folding here because you are not going to be left with gaps here or you you could have this situation where you have the detachment as you see along the least uh, main uh, detachment but also the development of other least folds that rotate these blocks and accommodate all the space. So you can you can see this. Uh, very schematically shown different types of geometries. And um, another thing that uh, we talk a bit here, a bit of structural geology, uh, you see when you have this uh, sliding along this such a detachment, yeah, you can see uh, we are not going to have a gap. We are not going to go and look there in, into a gap. No, what will happen, this part, of course, would not be stable. So uh, you would have what's called a rollover anticline being developed to accommodate, yeah, to accommodate uh, as the movement happens. We are not left with the gaps in the earth. So uh, the, the actual part of the crust here will bend into this rollover anticline. All right. Now, here is uh, an example of grabbins and horse. Yeah. So um, what what um, these authors call complex fold systems. Yeah. And the folds that form. So you can see you might have a detachment that is more complex. Actually, it's not only just very simple. So 
due to the movement along this, you would have the development of a rollover anticline here. Now, the, and this rollover anticline here will generate a rollover syncline here, for instance. Or you have the geometry here. And as you can see, we have here two gravens. You see them, two gravens and one horse being developed. And these type of holes, uh, which are opposite to the main direction along the main detachment fault are called antithetic. Whereas the ones that slip in the same direction as the main detachment fault are, are called synthetic. So you'll, you'll find this terminology in the literature and in the description. Um, also, you can see uh, quite a complex uh, situation here. You have the same situation like here. You have a, a horse, yeah. Um, you have these two gravels, but also you can see how you have the development, the detachment fault here um, would be this, but also there is a there is a splay if you want here, and then uh, some other uh, lithic faults being developed here. So we call this an extensional uh, duplex, for instance, for instance. Yeah. So for you to to see the terminology and to to expand the imagination of the various things, it's not always that simple. You have complications, and that's the job of us as geologists when we go and map to understand these geometries. All right. Now here is an example from the um, North Sea. Yeah, from the North Sea, and you can see again this was developed this uh, image based on the results of seismic reflection sections, many of them that were uh, conducted by the oil industry. And then these structures are quite well understood and you see how complex are here. But uh, but uh, you, you can see what's called here uh, a domino system. You can see a, a horse complex. Yeah, obviously this is a graven. So you can, you can uh, see that in reality, what we show schematically, exists in various parts um, of the uh, world. All right, so now um, let's get back to our uh, tectonic view. We, we did a bit of structured geology here. Let's get back to our tectonic view and, uh, and um, discuss about what's called symmetric and asymmetric crust extension. So this you can see now based on what we discussed in terms of the development of forced and graven structures, or the existence of a main detachment fault and rotated, rotated blocks, you can see this. Yeah, you can see this uh, symmetric and asymmetric models of crustal extension. And also, you see that these models are essentially what we call the pure shear, the pure shear versus simple shear models of rifting. So that's why we learned about pure shear and simple shear, those classes that were uh, maybe a torture for you <laughs> with, uh, uh, you know, um, more uh, mechanics uh, in them. But you can see that we can apply these concepts to our understanding of how extension is accommodated by the lithosphere. Um, now, in the pure shear model, you see, this is a pure shear. Um, you you see that the extension uh, is symmetric. So so basically the thinning of the of the crust and the lithosphere is symmetric. Uh, the overall strain is what we call pure shear. Yeah? Um, obviously, in the upper part of the crust we have brittle deformation and all these faults. In the lower part of the crust and in the upper mantle, um, the extension is accommodated by plastic deformation mechanisms. In the shear, a simple shear model, so the asymmetric model, as you can see it here, we have this main, it can be lithospheric scale, lithospheric scale uh, detachment fault. Now think about this lithospheric scale uh, structures. They are not only important structurally, but important from a point of view of economic geology because fluids can come and these fluids in the end can carry metals 
and uh, mineral deposits can be associated with this crustal lithospheric scale um, structures. So that's the idea. All right, so here the extension is controlled by movement along this main detachment fault. And you see the asymmetry, yeah? you see the rising asthenosphere here asymmetrically positioned from the point of uh, where you have the thinnest part of the crust, for instance. Yeah. All right, so the same information, this is, as you can see, this is taken from Fossen. Now, if I take it from this book, this is a book on plate tectonics uh, written by these authors, um, you can see the two models. Now, this is the first one, you see A, so this is the symmetric model and the text. Now, here in the text, I want to draw your attention to something. It says we have two different modes of crustal extension, and one is the symmetric one. Now, the symmetric one is also called the Mackenzie. Dan Mackenzie is a famous, a famous geoscientist, a professor of geoscience in the United Kingdom. And he wrote in Nature, he wrote, you see, in 1978, he proposed this model of uh, lithospheric extension. So this is also called the Mackenzie uh, model of crustal extension. Whereas later you have Wernicke who proposed the asymmetric model. And in many cases, the asymmetric model applies more than the symmetric uh, model. But of course, it's not that one is bad and the other is wrong. It's like we try to, we have simple models and we try to understand in various parts of the world where we have extension, which type, yeah, we are closer to which end member. All right, so you can, uh, you can read um, this text, but here is a part that I think it's important. You can see that it says the original bulge of the surface is caused by a hot, relatively light bulge of a stenospheric mantle. Yeah. So uh, what happens, imagine that you have the bulging of the mantle. So that leads to a bulging. So you have the extension, but also to a bulging of the, uh, the earth's surface. So you, that's why you get these shoulders of the rift and you start having erosion, start having erosion. Now, what happens, um, as you know, the boundary between the lithospheric mantle and the asthenosphere is an isotherm, isotherm. And when the process ends, the isotherm will, will basically go down, yeah, will go down. So this is what will happen. And then you will have thermal subsidence as well. Um, so if you are looking at old gravens that are no longer active because of the thermal subsidence, you will not see now the shoulders. All right, so this is uh, the asymmetric uh, model. So the asymmetric model from this uh, book, it explains to you uh, um, the text here, what is about. And as you can see, this was developed for the basin and range province, this model, because people realized that the, the structures that they see in the Western United States actually are explained by this model of extension. Right, and we have this master fault that we call the detachment fault that cuts at low angle, uh, as you can see, the crust uh, and the lithosphere. So that's the idea. All right, so I, I think you will read this. Uh, I, I think you find it quite interesting. And because we understand tectonics, we, under, we can understand many other processes that are associated with this, you know, uh, regional scale developments. All right, now let's introduce now a concept which I'm pretty sure it's new to you. I don't think it was discussed in the general geology course because it's a more specialized concept, but it's called metamorphic core complexes. Now, keep in mind when we discuss this, keep in mind this model, the asymmetric model, and keep in mind, you see here something that somehow you, if you remember about isostasy, you'll see because of this isostasy, we will have the development of a rise yeah, 
of this detachment. So this is what happens. It was observed and we have what are called continental core complexes. Very famous initially people understood what's happening in the basin and range province of the Western United States. Then they were discovered in many other parts of the world, as you can see in the Aegean part, for instance, uh, very famous there too. So where, where is Greece today, uh, Greece, yeah. But also you have oceanic core complexes and you see uh, it's not a coincidence. They are developed at about mid ocean ridges where we have basically extension. Uh, oceanic core, uh, core complexes. Some continental margin, continental margin suffered extension. All right, so what happens here? It, it is basically an arch. It's the detachment fault that arches up and gets exposed. And basically the, uh, the part that is above, yeah, the hanging wall actually slides on the sides of this arch uh, and it, the reason it's called metamorphic core complex is that very often you have myelonite, yeah, myelonite. So you have basically a fault rock. Uh, so metamorphic rocks are exposed basically uh, and the detachment surface is exposed. Um, and you see basically uh, what you see, the detachment has this zone yeah, underneath it, which is a, a very high strain zone and along this detachment tens of kilometers of normal faulting yeah, uh, in response to extension. So let's look at the development of these uh, structures. I think this shows you that you know if you start with the asymmetric model and the you continue the extension at some point this detachment surface is arched towards the surface and you can see the sliding of these blocks uh, on the on each side. Now they are called cordilleran metamorphic core complexes because they were first observed in the western cordillera of uh, of the North American continent. So that's uh, why they are called like this. And uh, because here the rocks are uh, uh, myelonitized, yeah, they are myelonitized and then you have intrusions and so on. That's why they are called metamorphic core complexes. So this is basically, this is the core complex. All right, let's look at, at uh, the development. Like I think that Fossen has a very nice uh, figure here showing you from A, B, C, as you can see, uh, you have, um, you know, this sequence of steps that will show you, you will show you basically the development of a metamorphic core complex. And as you can see, the isostatic adjustment basically, and the rising up the, of this arch, at, which at some point becomes exposed to the surface. All right, so this is very important. So please give it a, give it a thought uh, and you'll understand mechanically what happens. Now, this is again from Fossen. Uh, um, it, it tries to show you where you have some of these metamorphic core complexes. You see them in the Western Cordillera here in the United States. And you see here the Bayesian Range province. Um, so what happens, it will show you the exposed part. And um, this would be the exposed basement, yeah? Which is the foot wall, the foot wall of the detachment fault. All right. Now, what happens? Myelonite. Yeah, myelonite means basically uh, plastic deformation. It's a fault rock. But very often, uh, the myelonite uh, suffers cataclysis because as it is exposed, it suffers fracturing and, and breaking. So uh, it, it's quite complex in terms of fault rocks that we uh, found that we find that. All right. Now. Here is from the our textbook, this, this similar, you know, the similar idea. You can see the diagram here. You see these normal folds on each side of the core complex. And this would be what's called the metamorphic dome. All right. Now, people, the field geologists, took some time for 
people to understand what was happening, to understand the structures they were looking at. Imagine initially we didn't know about them and you are a field geologist and you go and map such a structure. It's not necessarily immediately evident what this is, what happened. Um, so you'll read this, um, but here are some examples. So this, as you can see, this is from the Washington state. So on the Western side of the United States where you have these metamorphic core complexes uh, being developed, you can see uh, this example. And this is basically what we are looking here. This is the detachment. You see, this is the detachment. So the detachment surface. And here, if you go and look, you will see the myelonite. So you can imagine the sliding happened along all these detachment surface. Yeah, probably these are blocks that slid on the detachment surface. The, if you go a bit to the east in Utah, yeah, uh, you can see uh, here the detachment surface and you can see that what's called rafts of the upper plate. So basically some remnants, the upper plate that slid with the development of this metamorphic core complex. So these are examples from the Western United States. So imagine if you were to go and map this, you see the scale of things. So of course you are at the beginning, you don't know what you are looking at. So that's why you have to carefully look in the outcrops at the rocks, put them together, map the whole area and understand in 3D what the situation is. I'm gonna show you now, uh, some examples from Greece as well. Um, these are from a different paper, as you can see. So if you were to be sent there to Greece, um, you see here on Naxos Island. Yeah. So let's say you go here, you go to Greece, you enjoy the beaches, enjoy the uh, sea, but you are a geologist and you start wondering and you go and look at the rocks and you see basically that they are different rocks and you wonder, well, what happened here? So as you can see, this is the detachment surface. Yeah. So here is the interpretation of this, of this image. This is a detachment surface. So these are these sedimentary rocks that slid, this package slid along this detachment plane. And you see the direction, yeah? You see the direction of uh, sliding. Uh, similarly, if you were to look at this image or you were there, you might say, wow, this is great, great geology. I want to look at the rocks and you go and, and see them and you see they are different. So basically the interpretation, you can see it here uh, in yellow and uh, uh, pink. And this is the detachment surface. This is Monzo granite. So it's an igneous rock, um, but you see it says, foliated cohesive ultra cataclysites. So these are fold rocks, fold rocks, yeah? Cataclysite, cataclysm myelonites, fold rocks. So basically all this package of sedimentary rocks slid along that surface. This was the core complex that was rising up. So very interesting, I would say. All right, associated with extension. So these are the regions that suffered extension. All right, so let's look at the evolution of a rift system. Um, you see this diagram, so three stages. And now we can link what we see here with, with what we discussed in terms of plate tectonics, because now you know the main elements of this uh, model of this theory, yeah? So imagine we have first a continental a continental uh, rift system. So the extension happens in a continent. So what we are gonna uh, notice here, of course, associated with the extension and the thinning of the lithosphere, look at these elements. So you would have, you see the asymmetric, the asymmetric type of extension here. You see these tilted blocks tilted, uh, they slid along these listric folds, yeah. So this is, uh, now it says a rift margin uplift here. So these are the shoulders of the rift zone. And here you see partial melting. 
the asthenosphere by rising up, it will suffer partial melting and the melts will penetrate the lithosphere. So we'll go into the lithospheric mantle uh, and then into the crust and they will evolve. And I'll show you in a bit what type of melts we can have there. But that's why you have magmatism and volcanism associated with these areas. Also, one other element I want you to see is something called basaltic underplating. So what happens is you have magma of basaltic composition, so mafic composition, um, and some of this magma would, would pool, would accumulate at the base, at the interface between the lithospheric mantle, which is ultramafic, it is peridotite, and the lower uh, and the base of the crust, yeah, the base of the lower crust. And this magma would pull there and would solidify that. And this would be basaltic underplating. Now, once it, it solidifies here, this igneous body is part of the crust. Yeah, it is not part of the upper mantle uh, by composition, yeah, by composition. And this uh, zones that suffered basaltic underplating were imaged by seismic um, investigations. So let's see. So this was the uh, rift stage, we, continental rift stage with non-marine basins. So it's still continent, continent. You might have sedimentary basins, but they are continental sedimentary basins. You develop lakes like in East Africa, yeah, you have this string of lakes in East Africa. Uh, deep lakes, because the, the lakes associated with continental rift systems are very deep. Baikal Lake being the deepest of all, yeah, in uh, Russia, in Siberia. We'll look at it next time. Now, uh, the B, uh, uh, B diagram here, it says rift drift transition. So rift drift transition is when the continent starts to being split apart, yeah? So maybe the extension got to the point where there was some invasion of marine waters, yeah, marine waters, and evaporite, evaporite are deposits of salt, for instance, yeah? Salt, uh, deposits of salt uh, in this sedimentary basin associated with the rift. And the final stage, which is called the drift stage, so basically, the continent is split apart. That's what happened with the Red Sea. Yeah, the Red Sea is this stage. It's a very narrow oceanic uh, basin. So we have oceanic lithosphere being formed. Yeah. So actually, now what you see on each side, these are passive margins. You remember we learned about passive margins. So the continent was split. We have passive margins. We have a mid-ocean ridge, yeah? So basically we got from the continental rifting and now we are at the stage where we, where we have rifting in the mid-ocean ridge, yeah? And we have uh, basically seafloor spreading and the new oceanic basin being developed, developed. And since it doesn't have subduction on each side, it will grow, it will expand like the Atlantic today. So the, if you look at the Red Sea and the Atlantic, Red Sea is a new one. The Atlantic is older, but it still has passive margins. Yeah? The Pacific is the oldest of them. And the Pacific has subduction. And at some point, the Pacific will uh, be closed. All right. So I think that now you can see the connections and very, very interesting what we are looking at. Um, now, I was mentioning about the the uh, magmatism, yeah, I, I drew your attention to the magmatism pro uh, magmatic processes here. So these are what type of igneous rocks, so igneous rock assemblages. So imagine, let's say we, you, you generate uh, mafic melts, like basaltic melts. They might make it to the surface, and then you'd have kind of basaltic uh, uh, volcanism. But Imagine that some of these melts would get into the crust and they reside for a while 
into the crust. And what will they will do? They will, in these magma chambers, they will, um, first of all, they have time to suffer fractional crystallization. That is a process, you'll learn with Marcos, that is the process where, you know, as a, mag, uh, as a magma evolves and its temperature decreases, you start having the crystallization of some minerals. And those are the minerals with the highest crystallization temperatures. And these are the uh, mafic minerals. So once you start having fractional crystallization, the composition of the magma from mafic changes, becomes an intermediate composition or a silicic composition because you get rid of those parts yeah, that are mafic. So the magma evolves. Magma might assimilate also uh, the crustal rocks around, you know, that surround the, the magma chamber. So its chemical composition will change. So you might have, in the end, uh, you might have um, a granitic melt, which is an evolved magma. Yeah, it is uh, a silicic magma making it to the surface. So in the rifts, you might have this bimodal, bimodal type of uh, volcanism uh, in terms of chemistry. You might have mafic melts yeah, that are transported right from uh, very, very deep, yeah, from uh, the lithosphere, they are transported and they are basalting composition. And you might also have felsic melts. Yeah, the, that's why they are called bimodal. All right, so, so various compositions in associated with the rifts. Now, finally, and this is, uh, we are getting into the final part of our, um, of our discussion today. Let's look at the causes of rifting, yeah, causes. Because here I have two different situations. We have something that is called active rifting and the other thing is passive rifting. So, so far we looked at the structure of the rifts. We look at, looked at what happens in terms of magmatism. We looked at how the thinning yeah, the, and the extension is accommodated structurally speaking. But now we are uh, thinking about the causes, yeah, which is important. You might wonder, okay, what causes actually extension? So um, obviously you see this, uh, <laughs> This uh, sentence, a uh, rift forms where the crust is pulled apart by tectonic forces, yeah? So pulled apart, what would cause this? So these are the two models. One is the active rifting. So think about a mantle plume impinging, yeah? Like pushing from below the lithosphere. So it impinges it. So by doing this, it locally, it creates yeah, an extension of this lithospheric plate. Yeah, so that's what happens. So this is the active rifting you can see. So the mantle plume uh, rises up, yeah, rising hot material, uh, and it causes this rifting, this doming. So you get, get this tensile stresses in the domed area. So basically what will happen You'll, you'll have a lot of magmatism here because of the uh, hot asthenosphere impinging upon the base of the lithosphere, uh, a lot of magmatism. But the extension would be limited because the extension is related to this doming, yeah? As, as opposed to the other situation where we have what's called passive rifting. And passive rifting means the, the cause for rifting is not there, it is remote, yeah? It is related to what's called far field stresses related to plate tectonics. So imagine if you have slab pool, let's say on a lithospheric plate, yeah? Slab pool on one side, slab pool on the other side. And this is a, a stress that travels, yeah? Through the lithospheric plate, it is rigid. So this stress will generate in a zone of pre-existing zone of weakness will start pulling it apart. Yeah, will start pulling the plate apart, these stresses. So 
this would be passive rifting. So you see the two models here of active rifting and passive rifting. Now the passive rifting, of course, will lead to the uprising of the astronosphere, but this is not an active uh, situation. It's not that the astronosphere impinges, pushes. It is that to accommodate the stretching of the lithosphere, isostatically speaking, then the astronosphere would rise up, yeah, which is basically the rising up of the isotherm. So th this is what happens. Um, so from the other text, text, yeah, I, I included some paragraphs. So here is a paragraph that explains about the formation of active grabbers due to the upwelling of a stratosphere where you have mantle plumes or hotspots. Yeah. So basically, this is what happens, and it explains about the volcanism and so on. And then some text for you to read about the passive process. Passive process. All right. So I think that these things are uh, pretty clear now uh, in terms of active and passive. Um, let's look at different causes of rifting. So the situations where you have extension. There are more situations. Yeah, we, 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 we showed you know, the ones that actually lead, like when you look at these two, this lead to uh, basically extension of the whole lithosphere and so on, these two end members. But now I'm proposing to you to end this class by looking at a few situations where we have extension. It can be very local, but extension. So let's, let's see. One of them is the one that we just discussed, the active rifting. Yeah, the active rifting, uh, can lead to to the thinning, to the split of the continent uh, if it's uh, intense and so on. Um, but but uh, look at this situation. Yeah, we have the uh, situation of a subducting slab, and we have the slab pull force here. So obviously, with the bending, with the bending, you'd create the a situation where you have in the slab here, uh, my mouse disappeared, but I, okay, here it is, uh, where you have the development of uh, normal faulting and, and extension in the subducting slab. So this is another situation, geologically speaking, where you would have conditions of extension. Um, here is something interesting. We are gonna talk about orogens, yeah? But because things are interrelated, uh, before we get to talk about orogens, uh, let's anticipate a bit and tell you that uh, might be counterintuitive because the orogens, you, you think about orogens as zones of contraction, yeah? contraction and uh, thickening of the lithosphere and all these things. So I'm showing you about extension in the context of an orogen, and this is a process called orogenic collapse or extensional collapse of an orogen. So basically think about the fact that indeed in the region of the orogen, you have thickening of the crust and of the lithosphere. You have this thickening. Now in the crust, you have this thickening and you have basically radioactive materials that generate heat. So at lower levels, mid to lower levels of the crust, the you know temperature increases and the material becomes uh, very plastic so it will flow so basically this is what will happen you have the collapse so in this part upper part of the lithosphere you'll have the collapse of the orogenic structure due to the due to the softening softening at mid crustal levels of the uh, material. Imagine you, you, you buy, you know, you, there are some uh, uh, varieties of cheese uh, called brie or camembert, yeah? And they have a little crust, which is white. And it's inside there, they are very nice. They are kind of soft. Um, 
and they are a bit yellow yeah so if you buy one of these it will be it will you know stay like this but if you put it in the sun the yellow part inside will kind of melt so this can collapse yeah this this piece of cheese can collapse under its weight because of the uh, warming up of its interior yeah so think about this analogy with the origin and the softening of the material inside the crustal part the mid crust of the origin due to the increase of temperature due to the thickening and the collapse so a very interesting process it was studied more recently yeah again people had to understand they were saying what's going on we see ext extension uh, structures in a zone of uh, compression how come but in the end we as geology as a geological uh, you know uh, world society we are trying to address all these problems and understand what's happening now what we are also witnessing we are going to talk when we talk about origins, we are gonna talk about back arcs, yeah, the back arcs, the development of back arcs, which means some uh, volcanic arcs um, uh, developed, uh, you know, in the, in a basin, yeah, behind uh, behind the origin. Back, uh, uh, when I say volcanic arc, maybe it's not good. There is magmatism associated with them, but it's an, an basin formed behind the origin. That's why they are called back arc basin. How come? How come that you develop this uh, when you have compression? Yeah, you have here the subduction process. So what happens? People realize that the extensional regime here is caused by the fact that this subducting slab. It's like this, let's say, suffers a process of rollback. So it retreats, if you want. And by retreating, what, what happens, we are not gonna, so imagine you have the subduction like this, and this retreats, we are not gonna have a gap here. So basically the upper, uh, the upper lithospheric plate will have to accommodate this situation and will suffer extension, yeah? will suffer extension to basically not allow a gap there to happen. So this is how you develop back arc basins. So very interesting. You would not think, yeah, it's counterintuitive that in, in these uh, compressional regimes, we develop extension. Two more. Um, this would, would be basically, um, it says this situation, which is, the passive, the passive <laughs> rifting, yeah? So plates are moving apart, yeah? Uh, so the stretching due to far fields stresses, yeah? And finally, uh, extension regimes associated with strike slip faults that have bends, yeah? So strike slip fault, we are gonna discuss about strike slip um, faults, but they have bends and where you have bends, you can develop a pull apart basin, a pull apart basin, like the the region of the Dead Sea, in uh, uh, the boundary of Israel and uh, Jordan, for instance. So the development of these pull apart basins, you see locally, you have extension, yeah, extension happening here, and the structures, the normal faulting at the surface associated with extension all right so i uh, took you through this very uh, long tour yeah um, of the process of uh, rifting and extensional tectonics this is it for you to read in this book so i'm giving you to to uh, consolidate the knowledge by reading a bit of text here you'll see the diagrams as well and this is it for today. Next time, keep in mind what we discussed today, and we are going to discuss about, about examples of rifting. So this is it. Thank you very much to all of you. If you have questions, please ask me.
If not, have a great afternoon. I'm going to see you on, uh, on Tuesday. Um, and um, I hope you'll enjoy uh, the weekend. If you are in Bogota with the quarantine, I don't know. Uh, try to go out a bit and enjoy, uh, in, enjoy the outside. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.